Eliza Talbot, Lily Talifario, William Turner, Sam Tyson, Collie Walker, William Epps, Reuben or R.T. Everett, Lonnie Foster, Joe Miller, Ruth Moore, Will Moore, Clarence Griffin, William Gurner, George Hawkins, Arthur Jones, Commodore Knox, Oliver Lane, J.L. Abernathy, Ed Adams, Greg Alexander, Kyle Arnley, Vance Arnold, Ed Baskin, William Bentley, Andy Brown, Willie Brown, Tom Bryant, Leroy Lacey, G.W. Lewis, Johnny Baker, Harry Barker, J.S. Hold, Edward G. Howard, Tony Lewis, Lindsay, unknown first name. Willis Maynor, Joe Miller. George Jeffrey, Charles Johnson. H. Johnson, unknown first name, last name Johnson. Howard Barons, James Barry. Ed Lockhart, Billy Hudson, George Hawkins, John Ward, Porter Williams, Laura Woodard, Ruth Oliver, Robert L. Osborne, S. H. Pierce, Billy Hudson, Ed Ingram, Andrew C. Jackson, S. Jackson, Ulysses Jackson, Tom Nelson, Louis Shelton, Celia Witte. Porter Williams, J. H. Wilson, Ira James Withrow, Shirley Wooford, Aura Woodard, Latha Rinkins, Bob Rivers, Brooks Roberts, Lewis Shelton, Florida Smith, Franklin T. Smith. Alex Stevenson, Ruth Carr, P.A. Chappelle, Dan Davis, George Danny, Diamond Carey, Elsie Walker, Henry Walker, Lane Robinson, M.M. Sandridge, Henry Gamble, Miranda Glaze, Miss Morrison, Andrew Neal, L. Washington, John Wheeler, Celia Witte, Hello and good evening. I'm Stephen Cutts one of the actors in and writer-director of Journey of the American Negro Motorist. Today, we celebrate what is now commonly called Black Wall Street, a vibrant community called Greenwood within the city limits of Tulsa, Oklahoma. This part of history was purposely excluded from our school books, so today we celebrate these beautiful African-American people who started their own city within a city at a time where they weren't welcome to enjoy eat, sleep, or dine in white establishments. With their own banks, schools, churches, movie theaters, and stores, you name it. Black Wall Street thrived with its own booming economy, rich with an abundance of life. On May 31st, into the early morning hours of June 1st, 2021, marked the 100 year anniversary of the massacre on Black Wall Street. 
and our piece today explores the history of Black American life while drawing a parallel with the current state of affairs today. I wrote this upcoming piece a lot in part due to my own personal connection, having grown up between the two cities, Tulsa and St. Louis, Missouri, where our story begins. The following staged reading performance will be an excerpt of my screenplay previously recorded for archival purposes sometime before the COVID-19 pandemic began. Now feel free to raise questions and add comments in the chat section as many of the creative team and talented cast, most of which played multiple parts, are here watching along with us tonight. Also, we ask you to please take this time to press that closed caption button at the bottom of your screens to follow along in the script, as it will only enhance your experience. Now with that said, and without further ado, tonight, we are honored to share with all of you Journey of the American Negro Motorist. Journey of the American Negro Motorist, written by Stephen A. Cutts. Superimpose. This is a fictional story based on true events in history. Exterior, interior, metro car, evening. The train zips through the city as Edric, an angst-ridden black teenager, wears a look of anger-driven determination. Superimpose. St. Louis County, Missouri, August 10th, 2014. The train arrives at the next stop as he pushes past other riders who block his path. He has a heightened sense of urgency and a blatant disregard. Moments later, he arrives at a protest rally for the police shooting of an unarmed black man, Michael Brown. The infuriated crowd chants passionately. For a moment, Edric shuffles uneasily behind a wall of people. He can't see beyond this barrier. He breaks the line, hurling a brick through a storefront. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! He is confronted by a massive group of machine gun-wielding SWAT team members in full riot gear. He goes silent. In an attempt to take control of the moment, he looks each of them over and before falling to his knees. He slowly raises his hands towards the sky. Interior, office, at the same time. A beautiful black woman in her late 40s packs up the remainder of her things into an empty box. She is dressed in a plain pants suit, however sharply. This is Anita. Missy, a perky young teacher no older than 23, interrupts. Knock, knock. Oh, hey, Missy. You scared me. Sorry, Miss Hicks. It's OK. How can I help you? Oh, nothing really. Just saying goodbye or see you later. Which is it, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, North Carolina. I haven't made that decision yet. It's been a lot. I understand. But if you're entertaining other opinions, I hope you decide to stay. Anita manages a smile. Missy goes in for the hug. Exterior, high school parking lot, moments later. Anita carries her box out to her car. It's hot. She's over it and ready to go home. Her cell phone rings. She tosses her briefcase into the trunk and answers. Yes, this is me. What is it? Yes. That's my son. What? Where is he? I'll be right there. She jumps into her car and speeds off the parking lot, hitting the curb on the way out. The sound of metal crunches as the front of the vehicle hits the street at full speed. Interior, St. Louis County Jail. <clears throat> Anita rushes into the lobby, disheveled and worried. You can take a seat. I'll call you up in a moment. I got a call about my son. I'm here to get him. Sure, you can take a seat. Please, I'm, I'm really worried about him. Can I see him? Ma'am, I can't help you at the moment. Just take a seat. Can you at least tell me if he's still here? 
Sure. I just need you to take a seat and I'll be right with you. You don't even know the name. She looks behind her to see several black mothers sitting. She leans in. It's Edric Wilson. Can you just let me know that he's here and I'll be patient? A brief moment passes. He's here. Thank you. Anita sits away from the other mothers, resting her clasped hands on her lap. She tries to curb her anxiety. Moments later, Edric is escorted out by a black male officer. He is defeated. Anita shoots up from her seat. Edric! Ma'am, are you this boy's mother? Yes, that's my son. Are you okay, baby? All right. There won't be any charges this time. He's free to go. Look, there's a whole lot going on right now. Just make sure he stays out of trouble. No, I will. You take care of yourself, son. She grabs Edric. Thank you, sir. Thank you. She nods respectfully to the other mothers as they exit. Interior, car, night. Anita and Edric sit in silence as she steers them down the freeway. Edric looks out the passenger side window. You have anything to say for yourself? He doesn't produce a sound. Anything at all? I'm waiting. More silence. Nothing. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Now you listen to me. Hey. Be quiet. You had your time to talk. Now I'm talking. I have worked too damn hard to make sure you have a roof over your head and food to eat. Heat in the winter and air when it's hot. I make sure your behind has clothes and even give you money to buy whatever the hell else you want. Look, Why? I because you're my son, and I love you more than anything. All I ask is that you try your best to do what's right, avoid trouble, and just stay alive. And this is how you repay me? Running in front of a firing squad? It's not about you. You're damn right it's not. It's about you. It's all about you. Everything. Every single thing I do, it's for you, Edric. They're killing my friends. And now you want them to kill you? That's your answer? That's how you want to show them? I've had it. I have had it, Edric. I can't take this mess anymore. You hear me? We're leaving. She researched the car. What you mean by that? I'm taking the job in North Carolina, and I'm getting you the hell out of this damn city. That's what I mean. What? It's my senior year. Don't I get a say? You've done enough. When we get back to the apartment, Pack up your stuff. We're leaving in the morning. I have had it. Exterior, Anita's car, apartment parking lot. Anita packs in her last few boxes as Edric sits on a stoop resting in defiance. He doesn't budge. She notices him. Boy, you better get your stuff in this car or you won't have any stuff at all. She continues arranging her things in the trunk. He still hasn't moved. Edric! Okay. He grabs his things. Interior, Anita's car, moments later. Anita and Edric have packed the car to capacity. She takes a second to catch her breath. Edric is still in no mood for conversation. Listen, you know I wasn't upset that you were protesting, right? I was upset that you didn't tell me where you were and that you acted out of anger and lost your head. When you jump in front of, a, in front of guns, that's suicide. And I think there are much better ways to prove your point when you want things to change. I know there are. If something's bothering you, you can always come to me, no matter how big or how small the issue is. I'm here for you. Edric hasn't flinched. Why don't we just make the best of this? It's just you and me now. You do know I got your back, don't you? Don't you? Have you ever thought about just getting away? Some someplace quiet, nothing but nature surrounding you and the sounds of peace? What's that even mean? No sirens, <laughs> no other people. Just you and nature and peace, you know? Yes. Then what? It's about taking those moments to reflect and reset. And I'm pretty sure that's what I used to do as a little girl before I even knew what those words meant. That's what I want you to experience. And I've never given that to you. And you should know what that feels like. 
I mean, back then my problems were so simple, way too simple to be considered problems now. I'm taking the, I'm talking the dog stole my dessert from the dinner table or my brother snatched the head off of my baby doll's body. Nothing like the things that I have to deal with now. Things like, like me? No, I don't deal with you. You're the only thing that truly brings me any joy these days. You gotta know that. And I know you, do, I don't, I know you don't care for the sentimental stuff, but I don't tell you I love you enough. You don't have to tell me. Yes, I do. No, you don't. I already know. For real, I do. You know, this stuff that's going on right now in St. Louis, all over this country, it's not new. You know that, right? Yeah, I know, and it fucking- Hey, killing. now, I get it. I wanna try to help you understand the root of it. And I think the best way for us to do that is to talk about where you come, where we've come from. Then maybe we can see clearer what we should be doing to make things better. I don't get it. I'm gonna tell you about your great grandfather. He lived through this stuff long before you were here. How about him? What about him? Oh, there's a lot you don't know. He was a good, good man, but he wasn't set up to be. He told me all about his life when I was a little girl, things I didn't fully understand until I got older. She holds up a mysteriously wrapped package. <clears throat> hey, what's that? Long before there was GPS, there was this book. Put it in the glove compartment for now. Well, let me see it. He grabs at it, she pulls it back, then passes it carefully. Hey. We have to make our way up to that part of the story. We're gonna take Paw Paul Henry's whole life's route to North Carolina. And I'm gonna tell you his story along the way. You mean you're gonna make this trip even longer? <laughs> you can't take the shortcut through history, son. You'll definitely miss something important. And that's what some people actually want you to do. Don't worry, it'll be interesting, I promise. So, you ready to do this? If you say so. Edric. Uh, fine. Where to first? Good. Now, let's start from the beginning. First stop, Anna, Illinois, where your great Papa Henry grew up as a boy. She starts the car. Exterior, train station, day. A massive black family's board of freight train. They carry their babies along with any belongings they can handle. Some angry, many afraid, as a mob of white men toting shotguns oversee their expulsion. Superimpose, Anna, Illinois, 1909. In 1909, a black man was accused of a crime and it sent an angry mob of white men into a rage. Although people were certain that it was really because the black men were taking work at pay rates that the white men were refusing at the time. In any case, they decided that it was time to rid the town of all the black families that had recently settled there to work the mills and pave the town's roads. Interior, church, basement, orphanage. There is one black boy present in a sea of white. The joyful sounds of toddlers playing together with no concept of racial prejudice or hate. Mr. and Mrs. Wilson, an empathetic white couple, choose a sweet little white child, Patrick, who refuses to leave his black best friend. This is Henry. After the expulsion, your papa Henry, who by this time had already been an orphan, was the only black person left in the whole town. He became best friends with a little boy named Patrick. A couple who couldn't have kids on their own fell in love at first sight of Patrick, who wasn't going anywhere without his best friend, Henry. After a brief huddle, the couple decides to take both boys home with them. Interior, Wilson's home, kitchen, day. The growing boys finish breakfast with their new family. Superimpose, 1912. Their new father, Mr. Wilson, owned a farm on the outskirts of town. And so they grew up being homeschooled by their mother while their father showed them how to work the farm. Exterior, Wilson's home, backyard, day. A few years older, Henry and Patrick run out back, roughhousing and tossing a ball back and forth. Superimposed, 1915. For a while, they lived a pretty secluded life, which worked out fine, all things considered. Interior, Wilson's home, day. Henry watches from inside the screen door as Patrick and Mr. Wilson head down the road. When the boys got a bit older, 
Henry started to notice little differences in their treatment and privileges. While Henry would stay home to help Mrs. Wilson around the house, Patrick would go into town with Mr. Wilson to sell and trade food from the farm. Mrs. Wilson gently leads Henry away from the door. Exterior, high school lawn, day. Henry searches the school grounds for Patrick. Superimpose, 1917. He doesn't see him at first, but notices peculiar and even cold stares from all the white disbursement of teenagers. Things got a lot more clear when he and Patrick enrolled in the town's public high school. The first year was eye-opening for Henry. Finally, he spots Patrick talking to a small group of boys. Relieved, he makes a hasty move toward him, but Patrick cuts him a look and turns his back to him. This stops Henry in his tracks. Exterior, high school, day. Teenagers swarm out of the double doors in groups, still all white. Superimpose, 1920. Now a senior, Henry files out and away from the mass towards a side dirt road, his school books in tow, alone. While the, while the brutal First World War was winding down abroad, Henry was entering his final year of high school, and things were becoming abundantly clear. Suddenly, a group of white boys appear in his view. They form a blockade as their leader, Gilbert, emerges. Hey, nigger. Henry attempts to move around them. They counter. You hear me, nigger boy? I said, hey. Henry tries to go to the other side. They move to counter, <laughs> stopping him again. Patrick appears within the ranks of the group. This paralyzes Henry for a moment. He is visibly crushed. Regaining his wits, Henry looks Gilbert square in the eyes with contempt. What do y'all want, Gilbert? <laughs> Wait a minute. Who said you could address me like that, boy? It's Mr. Gilbert to you. The boys laugh. <laughs> You've been one lucky nigga till now. Getting to live in a civilized town with good civilized white folks. You about a grown nigga now, and it's about time you be treated as such. Don't you think, boys? They agree. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we don't think you should be here at all. He shoves Henry. Henry clenches his fists. What's that, nigga? They start to squabble. Henry, bigger and stronger, gets the best of him, pinning him on the ground. Until the other boys jump in. They kick Henry feverishly. Patrick hangs back. Kick him, Patrick! Kick the crap out of this shit-eating nigger! Patrick hesitates. Do it! Or are you a nigger like this one here? Gilbert pulls out a handgun. I think he learned his lesson for today, Gil. Gilbert thinks about this, then decides to let Henry go. He joins the other boys as Patrick pulls Henry aside. You should get out of here. Go on, nigger! Patrick files in with the other boys as Henry grabs his things. They oversee his exit. <laughs> Interior, Wilson's home, the boys' room, later. Mr. and Mrs. Wilson enter to find Henry face down on his bed. Henry, what's going on? Nothing, I'm all right. Well, you seemed upset when you came in. She takes a step towards him. He recoils. What happened at that school, Henry? I don't ever want to go back there. That's what happened. Mr. and Mrs. Wilson give each other a knowing look as she takes a seat next to him. Henry, we, um, we never wanted, people can be really terrible, and sometimes they don't even know why they're saying the things they say. He sits up to face her, his face swollen from the beating. Oh, Henry, oh, I'm so sorry. Son, I don't know how we can protect you from all that. Patrick walks in. Henry rises to meet Patrick eye to eye. Tears stream down his face as he looks back at Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. I can't. They have no more words as Henry brushes past them. Exterior, Wilson's home, moments later. Henry sits on the front steps in deep contemplation. He stands, then takes off running. He doesn't look back. Exterior, train station, dusk. A train slows to a halt as Henry approaches the tracks. He falls to his knees in exhaustion. Willie, a sprite young black man on the train, spots Henry. Hey there, you okay? Henry doesn't answer. His breathing is heavy. You know you ain't supposed to be here. I oh, know. Willie helps him onto the train just as it's pulling off. Henry looks back at the town one <laughs> last time. 
Exterior, railroad, dawn, present day. Anita and Edric are stopped for a moment as a train zips past the intersection. The sounds of the locomotive and the crossing signals fill the space of their reflection. Superimpose, Anna, Illinois, 2014. The train clears. So, that was it? Yep. He never set foot in this town again. Take a look around. They pass a sign that reads, Population 4,442. It doesn't look like much has changed, does it? They notice the most all-white makeup of the town. I have an idea. And what's that? Look up the last name Wilson. Okay. We're gonna go by the old house. The GPS calls out, rerouting. Exterior Wilson home later. They pull up to the modest old home from Henry's childhood. It has most of the same charm from the early 1900s. A sign reads, Wilson family bed and breakfast. Barbara Wilson, a graying, kind-faced woman, greets them from the front porch. Well, afternoon, can I help y'all? Maybe. Is this the home of the Wilsons who had adopted sons named Patrick and Henry? Well, I'm Patrick's granddaughter. Are, are you related to Henry? Henry was my grandfather. Oh, well, come on in. Interior, Wilson home, living room, moments later. Anita stands in front of the couch, her hands folded in front of her. Edric sits, then stands, unsure. Barbara enters with tea. Well, please, you know, make yourself comfortable. Your family. Edric looks to his mother for the go-ahead. They sit. Oh, I've heard so much about your great grandfather. Now, now, what's your name, hon? Uh, Edric. Well, nice to meet you, Edric. I'm Barb. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> I'm Anita. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> really, I've always hoped a day like this would come. I just never figured out how to make it. So, <laughs> my grandfather never knew what happened to Henry. So, he spoke of him. Of course he did. He loved his brother. Well, such a shame then. Yes, it really was. If you don't mind, whatever happened after he left Anna? Actually, my mom was just telling me about it. That's why we happened to be in the neighborhood. Well, I, I thought it might be the case. You got time? Ugh. This is our off season. Time's about all I got. <laughs> all right then, where was I? Interior, rail car, night. <clears throat> Black men in work overalls fill the space. They are plenty and they are all in good spirits. Superimpose 1921. A handful of the men play a game of bets while most of the others make small talk. Henry, in stark contrast, does not participate. He stares at the roof of the rail car as Willie approaches. Hey, buddy. You all right? Henry looks over at him, then back toward the ceiling. Willie takes a seat next to him. Well, I'm Willie Johnson. What's your name, buddy? Henry. Got it. Now, what in the hell are you doing out in Anna, Illinois, Henry? You know we ain't supposed to be around there, especially after dark. I live there. Willie is at a loss. Did. I did live there. You gotta yeah. be shitting me. Now, everybody know that Anna stands for Ain't No Niggas Allowed. Henry turns away from him. That's the sun downtown. They got them all across the country. I didn't know that. Willie senses Henry's pain. Well, hey, you don't have to talk about it. We'll be all right. I'm gonna introduce you to the foreman in the morning. They always need more help laying the traps, and you're gonna need some money and a place to live. Won't be so bad. Then one day you can get your own place and not have to worry about it. Maybe even find your pretty girl, be your wife, one of these old towns, huh? Now how'd that sound to you? How pretty? How pretty what? How pretty that girl you talking about gonna be? <laughs> Oh, man, she gonna be the prettiest. She gonna be so pretty. Gonna make it seem like the whole world just stopped. 
Oh, yeah? For me. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. <laughs> yes, sir. Willie places a hand to his heart and a hand to the sky, the utmost truth. Yes, sir. Well, I can't wait to meet that foreman tomorrow, because I'm going to need to make some money to buy a house for that future pretty wife you've been talking about. Willie offers his hand out to shake. Henry thinks about it for a moment. He takes him up. Exterior, railroad tracks, day. The sun beats down on the men, all hard at work on the job. Superimposed, Jefferson, Missouri, 1921. Willie and Henry approach a tall, stern-looking white man. This is the foreman. Uh, hey, Miss Foreman. This is my good friend, uh, Henry, uh, uh, my good friend, Wilson. Um, uh, that's his last name, <laughs> and, and I already knew that. The foreman <laughs> gives him a knowing look. Uh, 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 fine, all right, well. He was trapped in the last town and about to catch his death, so I told him he could find some steady work down here. The foreman gives Henry a once-over, then hands him some paperwork from his pocket to sign. Exterior, railroad tracks, day. Some time has passed as the men realign the railroad tracks. Their moves are all in sync and expertly choreographed to a call-and-response song led by an older black man. He has a strong, yet strained to the point of cracking voice. They swing their tools as Henry joins in. Up and down this road I go skipping and dodging a 44. Hey, hey, won't you line them? Huh. 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 Willie gives Henry the look of approval. Exterior, train, night. The men are back to their usual late night activities. They are again in high spirits. Willie abruptly turns back from the train window. Hey, hey, hush up now. A few of the other men run to his side, including Henry. What is it? The train rolls slowly past a dead black man swinging from a tree. He wears a sign that reads, I was here after dark. They are silenced. Interior, rail car, night. The mood is much more somber as the men, black and white, relax and carry on. The train comes to a screeching halt. The black men perk to high alert as a group of white townsmen bang on the car. Open up! Just in time, the black men move into an adjoining car as the townsmen hop aboard for a look around. They are stone cold. Howdy, fellas! The white rail workers nod. Any niggas on this train? They shake their heads no. The men continue to look around the car. Are y'all sure about that? They nod. So we don't need to search this entire train. No response. The foreman enters the car. Everything all right back here, gentlemen? No niggas in this town, and we intend to keep it that way. Y'all carry on now. They leave. Interior, Wilson's home, living room, moments later. Barbara finishes her tea with a slurping sound. Awkward silence. More tea? <laughs> oh no. T honey, I've got plenty. Oh, no, I'm I'm cool. No help there. Avoiding eye contact, Barbara fixes her dress, grabs the tea tray, then heads toward the kitchen. <clears throat> A brief moment passes. Uh I think you scared her. I think she'll be alright. She wanted to know, and that's what happened. Everybody seemed so helpless back then. Sometimes you just have to get some through some things so you can make a difference later. Barbara re-enters. She fixes her dress once again. This is a, whole, a little hard to hear. Well, if you need some time. Anita stands and grabs her purse from the coffee table. No, oh, no, no, no. Please stay and, and, and stay here tonight. Things are not as integrated in this town as some of us would like, but it's better than it was back then. Anita looks at her. Is it? Please. It would mean a lot to me. Are you sure about that? Well, I would insist, but... Oh, maybe you need... Are you sure about that? Well, that would be nice. We can stay in the home your Papa Henry grew up in. Well, I guess it's settled then. 
Please continue, if you don't mind. I don't. Interior, rail car, night. The train is back in full throttle as the guys relax and discuss the next town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I heard. Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. They doing real good down there. Yeah, I've been there. I'm thinking about moving when I save enough. Find me some fine lady to settle down with. <laughs> heard they mighty fine down there, too. How fine? Mighty. I think I might meet me one. After me, maybe. Me and my lady, whoever she is, mm. gonna get us a little house. Have us little ones running around. Black American dream. <laughs> Sounds like it. Oh, yeah. I hear they got their own bank. They got their own stores. Everything. Is that true? Well, sure enough, you heard right. Well, hot damn. <laughs> if all you're saying is true, I might just figure out a way. I might go on and stave myself. <laughs> After me. Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Exterior, Tulsa County Courthouse, day. 1921. A group of white folks shout out at the top of their lungs. Their anger boils to the point of being uncontrollable. Superimposed, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. The sheriff attempts to calm them. Bring him down! Now, you men go on home now. We ain't going nowhere until you let us see that shoe shot and nigger. Sheriff, we're trying to ask nicely. I'm the law. Like I told y'all, the boy is in custody. You can be assured that we launched our investigation and the page girl has decided not to press charges. When a nigga lays his hands on a white woman, it ain't your problem anymore. It's ours. This riles the group. A group of black men pull up in several cars. They are highly concerned and they are armed. We got problems here, sure. Yeah. No, we got it under control. Y'all can head on home now. We're here to make sure the rolling boy is gonna be all right. The man said go now. We don't have no problem, y'all. Yet. The men in the cars stare them down. Y'all niggas got hearing problems? A black officer slowly approaches one of the cars. He removes his hat, reasoning with them. Hey, fellas. We got under control. Y'all y'all head on back to Greenwood so we can keep the peace. The officer walks back to his post outside the building. I'll stay. He hops out of the car. Another man joins him. As the group of cars roll off, a warning shot is fired from one of them. This sets the crowd of whites off the handle. They open fire on the black men both inside and out of the cars. The two black men return fire in an attempt to make it back to their vehicles, but are gunned down. Heard in the chaos. I hear they got a train full of angry niggas coming out here as reinforcements. I heard the same thing. What are we going to do about it? We can't just sit here and let these niggas take our city. Here we will. We'll stomp them out first. Like cockroaches. The chaos continues. Exterior Greenwood Market, moments later. The town is bustling with business as proud black folks walk the streets. This is the renowned Negro Wall Street. A well-dressed man tips his hat as a woman enters a bank. The loud bang of a shotgun pierces the peace. The intrusive sounds of gunshots being fired approach as an angry mob of white men swarm onto the street. Startled, a stunning young black woman carrying groceries drops her bags. This is Joanne. A black woman grabs her by the hand. Come on, girl. What's happening? We under attack. Joanne is stopped in her tracks like a deer in headlights, shocked. She grabs her by the arms until she gets it. Go now. Interior, Joanne's house, moments later. Joanne rushes inside. She knocks over a potted plant. She is frantic. Billy, get up. We gotta go. She runs into the room where her eight-year-old nephew Billy is sleeping. That startles him. She grabs a bag. Put your stuff in here. Everything you might need to go out of town. We gotta go out of town now, okay? He wipes the crust from his barely opened eyes. I ain't got time to explain, you understand? He nods, getting it. Joanne runs into the next room where her sickly Aunt Verna lays stiff and still in bed. Joanne kneels by her side. She holds her feeble hand. Aunt Verna, we got trouble in Greenwood. What you say, baby? Auntie, please listen to me the best way you can. They accused the Roman boy of laying his hands on that white girl who run the elevator down at the Drexel building. Oh, that Roman boy, he ain't do that. He's a good boy. His folks, done, they done raised him right. Yes, Auntie, but the white folks don't believe him and they say they gonna lynch him. She shows her the Tulsa Tribune. It reads, Nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator. 
Now, baby, you know I can't see that. My eyes done got bad off lately. Joanne realizes her mistake. I know. I'm sorry. But what I'm trying to say is we gotta go now, baby. We got There is a loud bang at the door. The banging continues and it is beyond intrusive. It's violent. Within moments, a group of angry white men plow through the front door. Anybody in here? We're taking all the Negroes down to the courthouse immediately! Alarmed and fearful, Billy squeals. Joanne hushes him. The men check through the first couple of rooms when a white man wielding a shotgun bursts in. Ain't none in here? Let's find us some live action. They begin to file out. One man holds behind, maybe hearing something. No, it's clear. They leave. Get your stuff. Joanne gathers the strength to lift her aunt from the bed. Interior, train car, at the same time. The men are carrying on as usual. Henry is fitting right in. They all react to him winning a hand of cards. Exterior, Joanne's house, moments later. The sound of a handmade firebomb hitting the roof interrupts their packing. Joanne knows this is life or death. Billy, let's go! Now! She grabs him just as the fiery ceiling caves in behind them. Exterior, Tulsa Rail Station, moments later. Bullets ricochet off the train as the rail workers watch Greenwood burn to the ground. Joanne and her family arrive in a frenzy. The train sounds off as the men begin to lift the family onto a car, only a couple of cars down from Henry's. The train begins to leave the station when a hand finally reaches out for Joanne. Just before she makes it up, Henry catches a glimpse of her saddened eyes. This stops time for a moment. Exterior, Wilson's home, day. Barbara stands outside of their car, emotionally drained. It hurts to think that my grandparents wouldn't have met if they hadn't been there, if they hadn't both been there at that horrific time. No, I know we just met, but I, I already love you both. We're family. Words aren't enough. Anita gets out to give Barbara a hug. May y'all be safe on those roads, and please, come back anytime. We'll try. You take care, Barbara. They pull off. Exterior, Tulsa building, rooftop, dawn, present day. Anita and Edric look over the industrial part of town that was once the booming community known as Black Wall Street. It's all gone. Yeah, it is. How about we go get something to eat? Edric pauses to take in the view a moment longer. Anita lets him take his time. You hungry? Yeah. Then get your butt over here so we can eat. Interior, exterior, cafe, day, present day. An older black man sits across from them. He intently stares out to the street as Anita takes a bite of her lunch. Edric broods. It's all, it's all too much. The old man jumps in. Oh, and they did a hell of a lot more than they said they did. I only know what my granddaddy told me. Well, I want to know everything. They don't even get close to the real number. What number? The old man grabs his cane and begins to stand, but Edric help, rises to help him. I'm okay. Well, we'll join you if, if that's all right. The old man nods and sits. Edric waves his mom over to the table. Um, uh, what number, mister? The murdered? Vignettes of the horror fill the screen as he continues. They call them casualties of the riot. So they couldn't file insurance claims when it was all said and done. Those firebombs are dropped from planes left over from the war. In the case of a so-called Negro uprising. <laughs> there was no uprising. They were mad because we had our own. What American city have you heard of being bombed from the air? We didn't like that some black folks even had pianos in their living room while some whites were struggling to make ends meet. Because of that, families were ripped apart. Children lost their mothers, their fathers. And parents lost their little boys, and their little girls. They witnessed them being shot to their deaths. Whole families. My grandfather Henry told me they recorded around 300? More like 3,000. 
3,000, and the number of white casualties was around 50. That there is much closer to the truth, but we'll never know. They made sure to keep all the actual facts out of the record books. They laid there in the dirt, right here where we sit and break bread and sip on our coffee. What? How could they just kill people off and, and lie like that? Yes. The way things are when the government turns a blind eye. Fuck that. Hey, Drake, don't. It's okay. You should let him cool off. The young man needs his time. My daddy saw his own father murdered in that massacre. That's what it really was. A bloody massacre. They weren't causing anybody no harm hiding in that basement. They just shot it? What about his family? He covered for them while my grandmother escaped with the three kids. He's the reason I'm here. He was a hero. And I never got the chance to meet him. I'm sorry. I wish there was something more we could do. Just tell the story. The truth will have its day. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Well, thank you for listening. You should probably go check on your son. He's a good boy. She shakes his hand. I know. Y'all take care now. The old man takes a sip of his coffee and once again stares out at the street, just as he was before. Anita joins Edric on the bench outside the cafe. She allows him space for the moment. I'm all right. You sure? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Let's just get back to it. Interior, rail car, night. Henry maneuvers his way into the car that Joanne and her family are in. She sits with her face buried in her lap. Henry removes his hat. Excuse me, miss. I don't mean to trouble you. It's just that I saw you. We all saw what happened. She doesn't move. Well, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just sit here in case you might need something. He squats next to her. She lifts her head briefly to see that it is indeed him, then back to her resting position. Later. What's your name, anyway? Henry wakes to find her staring at him. Um, me? Well, I'm, him, I'm Henry, but you can call me anything you want, really. <laughs> she blows this off. This doesn't faze him. Henry spots her new, her nephew and aunt sleeping in the corner. How they holding up? We lost everything. I'm real sorry about that, miss. They just took our city. Burned it to the ground right from up under us. Just like that. God have mercy. Then I'll be here if you need anything. I want to help you any way I can, Miss. Uh, Joanne. Joanne. Miss Joanne. We headed down to Texas. We got family down there. Unless you headed there too, I don't see how you could do much of anything to help us, really. Well, it turns out I'm going to be headed down to Texas, too. <laughs> I don't drink like some of the other fellas, so I saved up a little money. See, I've been needing to find some uh, stable work where I can sit down for a while. Maybe start my own family one day. Maybe have a farm. Well, yeah. Yes, ma'am. This produces the faintest smile from her. He notices. Interior, Texas home, living room, day, 1936. Superimposed, 15 years later, Texas. A very pregnant Joanne prepares vegetables in the kitchen sink. The even more strapping Henry embraces her from behind. She turns to meet him. No, no, I'm already giving you a second child. I know, I can't help it that you're even more beautiful when you're carrying our babies. <laughs> Their nine-year-old son, a few words, Melvin walks in. He takes them in for a moment, not getting what the commotion is all about. Hey, son. Melvin waves. You ready? He shakes his head yes. I guess we better be going then. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why you can't tell me where you're taking our child. I told you it's a surprise. He'll be safe, I promise. He kisses her. 
Grab your hat, son. He does as they head out the front door. She stops. Hey, don't make me run. Let me give my handsome son some sugar. She does. He wipes it off. She swats him on his behind. She watches them leave, loving it. Exterior, car lot, day. Henry and Melvin check out a shiny new 1936 Plymouth P2. It's a beauty. What do you say, son? I think your mama will like this one. <laughs> Melvin smiles in agreement. Yeah, me too. A white car salesman approaches. Y'all need something? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> he pulls out a stack of cash. How about a bill of sale for this here Plymouth P2? Moments later, inside the office, the salesman speaks to the car lot owner. They've got the cash for it. I don't give a damn. How the hell can I justify selling my cars to uppity Negroes when some good white folks can't even afford to buy them because they're taking all the work? Well, how do you suggest I deal with it? Tell them the car went up in price and you forgot to change it. Just get rid of them. Yes, sir. Henry walks in on the discussion. Gentlemen, everything all right? Well, I don't think I can sell you the car. Turns out you can't afford it. Of course I can. You already have the money. He hands him the cash back. This troubles Melvin, who tugs at his father's sleeve. <clears throat> My employee here misunderstood the true price of that vehicle. I see. He pulls out more cash. This should cover it. The two men look to each other. The car lot owner gives in. I guess I'll get the papers then. Henry tips his hat and takes a seat. Later, Joanne is placing dinner on the table when she hears a car pulling up. This concerns her as she moves towards the front door as fast as her body will allow. It's Henry and Melvin. Oh my god. Interior, exterior, car, day, present day. Anita and Edric coast down the highway driving past several large car sales lots. They pass a sign that reads, Welcome to Texas. Exter exterior, Texas home, dusk, 1938. Joanne sets the table for breakfast. Henry enters. Honey, why aren't you in bed? You've been working too hard all week. I was going to bring up breakfast to you to the room this morning. This is your day to rest. He kisses her on the cheek. You're the one that should be resting. He gently places his hand on her belly. I'm pregnant, not broken. Have a seat. Yes, ma'am. How do you expect me to sleep when I smell all this good cooking going on down there? Charmed, she saunters over with a piping hot plate. Should I save some for my son or have it all for myself? She hides Melvin's plate behind her back. Melvin, come get your breakfast before your daddy eat it all up. Melvin enters with his fishing hat on. He tips it to his parents and takes a seat at the table. Boy, what do you have that hat on for at the table? I'm taking my boy down to the lake. We're going to catch our dinner tonight and fix it all up. So you can take a load off. Ain't that right, son? Melvin nods. Well, that's nice of you fellas, but speaking of taking a load off, how hard are they gonna have you work and um, land those pavements down there? I don't want you to work yourself to death, Henry. Don't you go worrying yourself about me, Joanne. I'm still young and strong. I can handle it. I gotta make sure we're all good and right when this baby comes. Melvin finishes his food and takes his plate to the sink. He kisses his mother and heads towards the door. I guess that means it's time to go. <laughs> Who's in charge here? She takes his empty plate. He rises to kiss her. Not me, apparently. Melvin screams, oh no, suddenly. What is it, son? They rush over to him. The family stands at the front door in a hushed horror. The car has been vandalized. Beyond pissed off, Henry heads to the car and hops in. Melvin moves to follow him before Joanne grabs a hold of him. Henry, where are you going? Stay in the house and lock the doors. I'll be back. Keep your head, Henry. He pulls off. Exterior, interior, police station, day. Henry takes a deep breath in an attempt to curb his anger before stepping inside the building. A deputy sits at the front desk. Morning, sir. Mm -hmm. I need to report damage to my personal property. The deputy doesn't look up. Sir, what might you say happened to your property? Respectfully, sir, there's no might, it's a fact. Somebody vandalized my brand new car last night and we need to figure out who it is so they can pay for their damages. Mm -hmm. I would quite be 
busy today. All I can say is that it was probably one of your so-called friends. A lot of local white folks have been reporting incidents with the colored workers who have recently set up residence in this town. The best bet is to check it up with those fellas. I'm pretty certain those fellas wouldn't have busted out my tires and wrote get out nigga on my windshield. Deputy shrugs. Then I can't help you. Well, I'll need to speak to the sheriff. The sheriff, who's been listening in his office the entire time, shuts his door. Uh, the sheriff is not available at the moment, but uh, we've noted your complaint. You haven't written anything down. I said it's noted. I guess we run along now, boy. Henry eyeballs him for a moment, then tips his hat. Exterior, Texas home, day. Henry replaces tires as Melvin scrubs the car clean. Joanne greets them with a glass of lemonade. Melvin says, thanks, Mom. He gulps us down and gets back to work. How are my men doing out here? Henry takes a break from the tires to have a drink. Mm, we're making some good progress. Oh, it looks like it. She pulls out an envelope. Oh, before I forget, a letter came for you today. It's from Willie. He's in North Carolina. Good old Willie man. <laughs> Go ahead and open it then. Well, look at that. What's he saying? Says here that he settled down in North Carolina with a fine woman named Loretta. They've got a store there and it's listed in the directory for black travelers. Says a postman from Harlem named Victor Hugo Green made it for folks like us and they call it the Green Book for Negro Motorists. He says we should come up there to North Carolina sometime. Well, I'll be. Good old Willie man doing big things. <laughs> Interior, Texas home, bedroom, night. The family sleeps peacefully. The sound of a brick crashing through the window wakes them from their slumber. Henry jumps out of the bed. Henry! He rushes out to the front of the house, catching a pickup truck skidding off. Men yell out. Get out of town! Uppity niggers! Why don't you show your faces? Henry turns back to the house. Joanne and Melva meet him at the door. Cowards. What do we do, Henry? He stares at her, defeated. You know I'd much rather put up a fight. I have to protect this family first. He places a hand on his son's shoulder and kisses his wife's pregnant stomach. I want y'all to pack up all your stuff. Everything we can fit in the car. We're gonna leave before sunup. Henry embraces his family as Joanne weeps for the loss. Exterior, interior, gas station, day. Henry fills up the tank. The station owner, a friendly faced white man takes Henry's payment. Thank you, sir. Henry keeps an eye on his family back at the car. Where are you folks headed with all that stuff? Henry takes him in for a moment. He's okay. I'm not sure. They're away from here. Uh, east, I suppose. The station owner hands him back his change. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. The station owner's wife enters from the back with a small baby in tow. Please, sir, take this. It's the green book for Negro motorists the Black Traveler's Guidebook that Willie mentioned in his letter. We couldn't imagine us having to go through what you folks did. I heard about this book. <laughs> Henry reaches into his pocket for the money to pay him. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Henry tips his hat at him. He does the same. Interior, car, moments later. They open the green book, take a deep breath, and drive off. Melvin looks wistfully out the window. Interior, exterior, car, dawn, present day. A police officer in a car pulls up behind us. Too close for comfort. After a moment, the car eventually passes. Edric is visibly disturbed. Superimpose, Arkansas. We're not too far from the border now. We should be there in no time. Yeah, if we don't get taken to jail first for just trying to get there. Mom, I've been thinking maybe dad was lucky to go out how he did. Baby, this might be too soon. I don't know if, if I want to get into the, all that. Now just hear me out. He went out in a car crash. Boom. Dead. Instantly. Dad had no clue. He didn't suffer. He left us in peace. Michael Brown, he knew. 
That cop was terrified of him, so he had to die? I know. It ain't fair, and it ain't right. You know that could have been me, right? I know, baby. I'm glad it wasn't. Here's my man. He reclines his seat once again, looking for solace out the window. Hey, what about some something good on the radio? They take turns flipping through stations until they land on A Change Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. They both approve. Anita hums along to the radio as Edric reaches into the glove compartment to pull out his great-grandfather's preserved copy of The Negro Motorist Green Handbook. He opens it as Anita continues the story. And as the story continues, Henry and his family continue to face hardships, some that threaten their livelihood even more than they experienced before. Eventually, they settle in North Carolina where they are reunited with Willie and make fast friends with his family. Henry sets up an uncommonly thriving farm on the land he acquires. They live out the rest of their days there. At the film's conclusion, Anita and Edric also reach the old family home. There is a sense of peace. In the final scene, they decide to visit the same local church where Henry and the family attended those many years ago. We pick up there. Interior, North Carolina Church, day. Anita and Edric enter just in time for a stirring sermon. They take a seat in the back as the preacher implores the congregation. Vic, your battles wisely, folks. We can rise up against the hatefulness, not only with our voices, but with the compassion and our God-given intelligence. The repressed have become the resilient. For the strength of our ancestors is resounding. Oh, can you hear it? It conveys many things. But today in this time of necessary resistance, I hear it say that there is still power in love. In the midst of all the hate, in the midst of the pain and the confusion, there is still power in love. There is still power in understanding. There is still power in forgiveness. But can you hear it, church? Please, people, can you hear it? Loud as the rolling sea, let it resound. At the same time, a white man armed with a semi-automatic assault rifle stands just inside the church doors, listening. Interior, church basement orphanage, flashback, 1901. There is one black boy present in a sea of white. Toddlers play together with no concept of racial prejudice or hate. Roll credits. Mm -hmm.